being understood by individuals, right? Mm -hmm. um, being understood as an organization to those individuals. But the other part of it that a lot of people overlook and the part that I pay a lot of attention to is being understood by machines. Yeah. Is being understood by algorithms. So how do the algorithms work so that, you know, they're the gatekeepers? How do we, how do we um, take those into account so that we're being discovered by audiences that don't know about us? Welcome to Being Understood, a podcast where we explore communications, the people behind the scenes who are helping to communicate and what it means to be understood in a time where how to be understood is really difficult to do because media is so um, fragmented and we have so many different channels that we're trying to um, communicate through. Hey, Bess. Hey, Liz. How are you? I'm great. Awesome. And we have our friend David Erickson joining us today, our digital director. Happy to be here. Yeah, you've got a little experience under your belt, so that's why we wanted to bring you in to talk all things digital. So how long have you been doing your thing? 30 years. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Did you know Liz and I have about 40 years combined? Mm -hmm. Combined. Not separate. 70 years all together. Yeah, 70 years. That's there a long time. So yeah. I think we've got a lot of knowledge there to go, go off of. Yeah. So I think before we get into all the fun digital things, let's hear about you. Where did you grow up? I was born in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. um, we moved to New Brighton, Minnesota when I was uh, like first grade, probably. And mostly, mostly grew up uh, in New Brighton for about a year and a half. Uh, my family moved to Fort Wayne, Indiana. Lovely. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> came back. Uh, <laughs> came back from Fort Wayne during my uh, lived in Fort Wayne for my um, high school year and a half in high school. Came back in my senior year. Our house had not sold at the time, so we moved back into the same house that we lived in in, in Minnesota. Oh, funny. Yeah, and then um, yeah, we went off to college in Iowa, Co College. Ah. Uh. How did you get into digital? Yeah. Um, well, it all starts with my older brother, Jeff, who, when he was in college and I was a little kid, used to come back from college, and he started reading to me. He read The Hobbit, and that kind of got me, I, that's what inspired my love of reading. Okay. And he also was a science fiction fan, so he had all these science fiction books around, um, and I happened to, they're around, so I started reading them. And uh, science fiction, I to this day, cite it as one of the things that makes me good at what I do, because it taught me to think about the future. It taught me to think about you know technology as it is now and extrapolate it into the future and what might, how that might change the world, change society, change technology. That's neat. I like knowing that because it makes a lot of sense with your career because you been in digital far longer than most people were even thinking about it um, and maybe tell us a little bit about that because I think it's an interesting part of your experience and your history that you've grown with it but I'd also take somebody who likes learning and growing and continuous change and being comfortable in that to keep growing with it so talk a little bit about that history um, and I will remember that, <laughs> that <laughs> connectivity to how you yeah. how you got into it and where you see it yeah. going. Yeah. So I mean, I, I mentioned I went to school in Iowa at Co College. Mm -hmm. I was an English major. I actually started out as a music major, um, and then realized how difficult that would be. Yeah. And decided I didn't want to work that hard. <laughs> so, I don't blame you. Yeah. Is it because of your love of guitars, playing yeah, yeah, guitars, music, that you were a music yeah, major? Yeah. 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 Um, so I quickly switched to being an art major. So. I essentially, I didn't officially get a minor in art, but mm -hmm. I basically got one just from the study. And then uh, <laughs> then realized my limitations of executing the visions that I had in my head. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't that talented. <laughs> 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 so I switched to an English major, I ended up with an English major, just because I love reading, right? So right. I was not thinking, you know, other people were thinking about getting business degrees and stuff. I was like, uh, I just want to enjoy what I'm doing. Um, turned it out to be not a very wise decision because coming out of college, like that wasn't very useful. Yeah. Um, I ended up doing, 
freelance copywriting for some advertising agencies in town. Wasn't very good at it at all, but I didn't know it, so, you know. <laughs> but, I mean, the, 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 the uh, English major, again, that's another thing that had no value to me coming out of college, but since it's like another thing that I credit being as good as I can be uh, in this field because, you know, as you exam as you study literature, you're examining it from many different levels, mm -hmm. you know, just reading it, how does the story work, what's the technique for telling the story, the empathy that you need to understand the story, the, the uh, characters' points of view and everything. We need that right. in spades, like mm -hmm. it, in, in our field. So uh, that too um, has, I, I credit that as being a, a, an edge that I have, for yeah. lack of a better word. Um, critical thinking. Got to figure out how to, how all that stuff works. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, so I kind of cast around a bit. I didn't really know what I wanted to do or how to do it. I knew what I wanted to do, but yeah. uh, I couldn't be paid for what I wanted to do. Can I just do a side note yeah. for anybody who listens to this or watches this and is in a place of like I don't know what I want to do? I think it's fair to say that nearly every professional needs some time to figure that out and it's good that you share that because I think a lot of people only tell the the all the wonderful things right. I did but not some of the the learning and growing and so it is okay if you don't know what you yeah. want to do and yeah. keep exploring 100%. and finding things that you enjoy yeah absolutely yeah so yeah I worked at uh, let's say out of college I worked at the Cedar Rapids Gazette writing copy for <laughs> Classified advertising, so that's not really that was rating an, yeah. important. <laughs> that was important, yeah. right? Um, I worked for a while at a at a marketing research aid, uh, company called Epley Marketing. Uh, they did um, consumer research, and so they did surveys, open-ended questions, closed closed questions. But it was mostly, it was the beginning of kind of asking open-ended questions, getting the rich detail that you get from those open-ended questions. And, um, you know, on the strength of my English degree, I got hired and then quickly fired because I was not very good at it. <laughs> at least you're honest. Well, yeah, I, we would have, if, I wouldn't have hired myself at that time. That's fair. If I knew what, you know, because I really couldn't write myself out of wet paper bag, kind of, you know, the, <laughs> the grammar and all the things that you kind of need yeah, to have. minor details. I had creative writing ability. I just didn't, I needed a really good editor. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, um, then, then I kind of hopped around to different and moved back to Minnesota. Uh, I managed a restaurant for a while. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah. Huh. Uh, um, so customer service, got that. Yeah. Uh, ended up at uh, Norwest Bank, where my mother was. She got me a job there. That was brutal. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was a it was a third shift, so it was like, you know, we would work from. 11 until 5 in the morning, whatever. What, what would you do? Was. I didn't even realize they, they had do a processing third shift checks. Like basically, it's just process. When oh, okay. people used to write out checks, yeah, yeah. they'd get a, send I still them back do to once the bank. Yeah, 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 don't judge. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I did that. Um, first experience of having happy hour at, at 6 in the morning. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh God. Because <laughs> everybody, all, we all get off work at the same time. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let's go out for happy hour. Um, <laughs> And then what else? Oh, I started working at Dayton Hudson Corporation, which is now Target, and in their corporate headquarters. So I got a lot of a lot of retail experience. It was a weird little department that I worked in, but um, and then the internet came around. I'm like, that interests me. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the first time I really got into, so I was getting into politics at that time mm -hmm. as well, and Minnesota had held the first ever online gubernatorial gubernatorial debate via email what year was this it was 1994. oh yeah and um and i saw that and i'm like oh my god i can see where this is going i want yeah. to know about that um so i started like investing the, the organization that held it was a nonprofit called e-democracy mm. and it was run by a guy named steve cliff steve is a very good friend of mine now yeah um so i found him and uh Got email, <laughs> <laughs> and from there, uh, from there, then the web came about, and I'm like, okay, so how do I do this? So I learned how to write HTML code, and started designing web pages for people as a side business. Uh, my department at at, uh, at Target got closed, 
So I, I, I just started doing freelance. And uh, back, before, back when people were asking, well, we, do, we, do we need a website or not? Mm-hmm. So it was a lot I mean, of small People probably business. didn't even really comprehend what they were, yeah, the significance yeah, of them yeah, back then, did yeah. they? No, not, not to really. date you at all, David, no. but <laughs> I mean. Well, I ended up doing websites for political candidates. Yeah. You know? And so, um, yeah, so then I just, my, my career kind of paralleled the rise of the internet. So I first learned how to do websites, I learned how to do email marketing early on to build mm-hmm. audiences for the websites, because yeah. there wasn't a search engine at that time. And then search engines came around, learn, learn how to do search engine optimization, social media, all that stuff. So I've had the luxury of being able to focus on one channel at a time and kind of learn it deep Yeah. Um, as those things came mm-hmm. came about, which I don't think is possible anymore. There's just too much. You kind of, in digital, kind of need to specialize in one or two areas. Yeah. I mean, I don't think we can really imagine our lives without social media. So like you being involved in it so early on, like what were your thoughts as like social media started to come into the whole digital world? I mean, again, it's a new thing. And I'm like, how yeah. does this work? I'm fascinated with it. And, um, and uh, so I was an early adopter of Twitter, Facebook. I had my, my space before Facebook. I actually did <laughs> one of my, one of my, I wouldn't call it a bucket list because I didn't think of it at the time, but I got interviewed by, um, G4 was a, it was a cable show devoted to video games, hmm. and I got asked to be on a, a interview panel with a New York Times reporter about the what they were calling say, the MySpace primary, oh, gosh. where candidates were using using MySpace to you know, promote, and uh, and I got <laughs> it was like oh I watch that show all the time it's cool uh, I don't so, think so. that people who never we're active users of MySpace can appreciate how important it was and how in, how engaging it was. I mean, you you could um, do so much to uh, express yourself in ways that social media does not allow you to do anymore. Yeah. Were you an active user? I, I was. So we I probably was. all had our favorite song on there. Um, our best your background friends. was colored however you wanted it to. You could personalize everything, and you had all of these networks of people that you connected with. I met a lot of people who became real-life people in my life through MySpace. Yeah. I mean, I always knew when a friend was mad at me because I'd get bumped out of, like, first, second, or third. (laughs) (laughs) Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. That's not something I paid attention to. Yeah. No, you could rearrange the order of, like, your top friends that (laughs) appeared on the main page, and, like, that's when I always knew someone was mad is I got... Bumped. Well, that's that's <laughs> the distinguishing characteristic of all the other channels before it is yeah. like the social yeah. aspect of it and being aware yeah. of of the fact that yeah. some how how are you listed among your friends? <laughs> no, it was a thing though. No? Well, and it it came pretty quickly before things like Napster and all these yeah. other tools that we are familiar with having to find music. Um, I never stole any music, I promise. But um, uh-huh. we, shareless. <laughs> but we all like it became a discovery engine. You could discover artists on there. Yeah. Um, you could discover celebrities. I mean, it really was the beginning of bringing the internet into a much more engaged experience. Mm-hmm. Obviously, there are things like AOL and stuff like that that we all know as well. But it was more accessible um, mm-hmm. and not closed off, which a lot of those other networks previously had been closed networks, and yeah. it was kind of the first time that it became an entryway into, I mean, I think about it still, like, think about when you're looking up people on LinkedIn. I mean, we have all these tools now that do what it used to do. It kind of encompassed all of those yeah. things, so it's yeah. pretty neat. Yeah. My big um, kind of aha moment, I don't know if it was an aha moment, but um, early on in social media when, you know, it, at that time the millennials were the generation that everybody's talking about yeah. and they're taking to social media and everything. And it was like, okay, this is the first generation in the history of the world to have grown up with the notion that they have their own audience. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if you have an audience, you have to perform the, for the audience, right? Right. I think we're seeing some of the negative aspects of social media. That's kind of that's playing itself out. Yeah. So. It is interesting. Mm-hmm. 
Can I talk about your agency experience? Because you've worked in quite a few agencies. David is someone who at Toonheim we call a boomerang. He was here once, <laughs> left, and then came back. But you've been in agencies of different sizes and, um, and different scopes of work, but always in a digital capacity, um, at least in the last, for sure in the last 20 years. But, um, and you've been on your own. So talk about that experience of agency side and because I always think about it that we're in a unique position of getting to bring outside expertise and we're lending that to a brand as opposed to being on the inside where when I was at Best Buy I felt like I really knew that brand I cared about that brand I protected that brand I worked hard to bring that brand to life in the box that I was in mm -hmm. um and that's different in an agency experience. Talk about the experience being in an agency, running digital, um, and what do you really like about that? So, I mean, yeah, as you said, I've had a bunch of different experiences. As I mentioned, that I, I started out doing freelance, uh, right. freelance um, web design. Um, that turned into, well, I should start my own agency. And so the con I basically I was like, I'll create an agency that's just digital marketing. Yeah. Um, and for the for the most of the time, uh, I was doing website design because people weren't thinking of an agency like that that just focused on digital. Um, and then I, I so I did that, and then uh, partnered with a friend of mine, Blois Olson, who had his own public relations agency. Mm -hmm. We we're kind of sister companies, so we'd work on. Uh, our own work on the same clients together. Um, we started publishing a, uh, a website that covered Minnesota politics. It was a website first, but it was basically a blog before blogging technology existed. Um, got a lot of mileage out of that. 1998, Jesse Ventura ran for governor of Minnesota, so mm -hmm. a lot of attention to Minnesota politics. And uh, and yeah, we're very popular, built out a mail, uh, uh, email list out of that as well. Um, ultimately sold that to, well, turned into politics in Minnesota, merged with another uh, publication, and is now, was politics in Minnesota, but I don't know what they're called now, Minnesota Lawyer, yeah. whatever. Uh, anyway. Um, but it's so interesting you bring that up because Boyce continued to do a lot of that yeah. and continues right. today. I mean, yeah. anybody who works in politics in Minnesota probably gets his dailies. So, I mean... It's interesting to see longevity in these mm -hmm. things too, and I know you also produce content every day. So anyway, back to what you were saying. No, um, yeah. So I mean, we I, I had kind of kind of agency PR agency experience just by being exposed to, to that side of the work uh, with Blaise. But then, um, yeah, then came to Schoenheim, two thousand eight, uh, and that was at the beginning of the the rise of social media. Yeah. Um, it was that, that experience. The birth of, of Twitter. <laughs> birth of Twitter, exactly. Yeah. Um, that, was ex that was interesting because, you know, the larger, so my agency, I dealt with small businesses, right? right. Basically, that's you know, political yeah. stuff. Um, larger agency, you have larger clients, and they are more <laughs> cautious. They have, yeah. the, the smaller clients are, have, you know, are willing to take bigger risks, mm -hmm. um, but the larger clients don't. Yeah, and so I remember going into talking to some of our clients about social media and just being shut down. Like, I'm not going to let our people do Facebook. No, no, not at all. Why do you think it is? Do you think it's because they just didn't have enough knowledge about it? Or? I think so. I think so. But also at that time, I didn't have a ra I didn't have yeah. a, a solid rationale for why they should. That makes sense. Right? It's yeah. new. It's something you need to pay attention to. I knew that much. Yeah. Right. But I didn't know enough to know, okay, this is how exactly you can use it, and this is why it would be beneficial for you. That right? makes sense. So making that argument was tough. Mm -hmm. um, so the stuff that we did at Tune my first time was the smaller clients that we had who were willing to take risks. So Punch Pizza was one of them. And they, they you know, we did great work for Punch Pizza. Mm -hmm. uh, they all do their social media now in-house, which is how, how, how it should be. But... A lot of mileage out of, out of the work that we did. Izzy's ice cream was another one. So mm -hmm. those smaller businesses were willing to do the stuff that that um, that I was doing at that time, um, and then and then I left 
left Toonheim, uh, did freelancing a little bit, and then joined another agency called Karwaski and Courage, led by Glenn, Ka Glenn Karwaski, who actually gave me my first informational interview out of college. <laughs> like, what? Yeah. Things all come full circle yeah. somewhere. Yeah, no uh, kidding. Uh, he is uh, he's a good guy. He's a friend of my sister's, so that's... Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, but was there for about five years, and, uh, and uh, that was a larger... so. His public relations agency, coupled with Martin Williams Advertising, are both s essentially sister companies owned by Omnicon, mm -hmm. and uh, on the same floor. Um, so I got a real exp exposure to the advertising agency world as well, which is significantly different from public relations. Oh yeah, and um, that was interesting. That you know, got to work on on big clients, um, and so I got that, and then then left. Cross and Courage again. Did some freelancing in between. Came back to Tunheim for my second stint, and uh, and uh, and here we are today we in are. a multi-channel or omni-channel. Have to be on digital. Yeah, yeah. the world and has changed significantly since my. First where stint. you should be is the hardest part, yeah. probably. No. Yeah. What do you think? Since you started to now, has been the most interesting development as far as digital goes. And don't say AI, because we'll get to that. We'll get to that. That's a whole different story. But aside from AI, mm -hmm. what do you think changed things the most for people? Um, I Well, I don't know if this is the answer, but um, at the beginning, the, 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 my, so, my aha moment for wanting to learn this stuff, the politics, mm -hmm. that's what's changed is at the beginning, e-democracy, yeah. a nonprofit devoted to using internet technology for democracy, uh, was where I was like, oh my god. So it's leveling the playing field in mm -hmm. terms of power, right? Um, all of a sudden, and I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm an, opinionate, an opinionated guy. I like to right, spout right. my opinion so I can self-publish and, and say what I want, right? Um, so all of that appealed to me. Um, but a lot of us were thinking this is really a tool for democratization worldwide. And mm. for a long time it turned into that, right? You wouldn't have had the Arab Spring without Twitter, right? Yeah. Um, organizing uh, organizing on, through, through social media is standard operating procedure now, right? But we've got the, back to, we've got the ugly side of politics now. We've got right. this information, we've got uh, non-state actors and foreign adversaries who are messing with our with our politics and democracy. And so I didn't see that coming, but I probably should have. Interesting. There's always, for every upside, there's a consequence, oh, right? Yes. And more connectivity, we're seeing and dealing with some of those consequences yeah. now. But there's still good things about yeah. social media and um, digital. So this podcast is about being understood which is two times core credo, as you know, and we talk about a lot mm -hmm. in terms of how we want clients to think about how we measure what we're doing, um, their goals in what we're doing, and also um, thinking of how we think about who needs to understand them. So audience building and the work around making sure you're using the right <laughs> channels mm -hmm. in order to reach those people as opposed to seeing everything needing to be everywhere. Um, so given how much channels are digital, how much information is shared digitally, um, how do you think about this concept of being understood and how do you help clients do that? Yeah. Um, so when I talk to clients about, you know, okay, we, we sometimes have clients who say I need social media or I need a website. And it turns out that they need something else, right? So we start asking those questions. Why do you need, why do you feel you need social media? Why do you feel you need a website or whatever it is? And asking the deeper questions to get to the root of the problem. And the problem is a communications problem, obviously. That's what we're here to solve. Um, but it changes, having that conversations help them broaden their pers perspective about what it is they really need. Once we identify that, then I go to, okay, what is it that you need to accomplish from a business standpoint, from an organizational standpoint? What's your goal? What's your objective? Um, what do you have to offer? What assets do you have to accomplish that goal and that objective? Uh, and then to your point, who is it that we need to talk to? 
in order to accomplish that objective. So then you're starting to identify who those audiences, who those case, key stakeholders are that will help you achieve that goal. And then once we do that, go deep on who they are. So doing a lot of, a lot of research on that audience so that we can see the world from their point of view. So in my world, then that's, um, it's asking a lot of questions. We do our key stakeholder interviews mm -hmm. that we get insights from. Uh, we do digital, you know, open source data on that audience, uh, social media listening, um, but even getting to the point where now I'm like, how do we build out a psychological profile? Mm -hmm. So if you understand you know, how I go by the five, big five personality types, ocean, open, openness, conscientiousness, uh, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. There's a spectrum along, uh, on which any given person can, can rate on those. Once you understand that psychological makeup, that personality makeup, then you know which, what language to avoid. Yeah. So especially in politics, where we do a lot of clean energy stuff, you can't talk to a more conservative leaning audience and use the word climate change because they'll just tune you out. They just won't right. listen to you, right? So what is the language that we can use where they're gonna, gonna actually listen to you without just shutting down? Um, and, and getting at that deep And sick, want to communicate and with want you. To communicate. Because right. if you're shutting them down right away, then conversation's over. They're yeah. not even open to conversing as opposed mm -hmm. to messaging and thinking about ways to keep someone open. Yeah. So understanding that psychologically and then, then you can get into figuring out what the messaging is and what the language, what kind of language you use. Once you understand that audience at that deep level, the strategy for accomplishing that goal writes itself because they tell you what channel they're hanging out on, yeah. how they view the world, um, what cultural touchstones we can use to, to, harm, to hijack their attention as it were, right? Um, so that's, that, that's kind of the approach, but then the other part of it is um, being understood by individuals, right? Mm -hmm. um, being understood as an organization to those individuals, but the other part of it that a lot of people overlook and the part that I pay a lot of attention to is being understood by machines, Yeah, is being understood by algorithms. So how do the algorithms work so that, you know, they're the gatekeepers? How do we, how do we um, take those into account so that we're being discovered by audiences that don't know about us? How do you figure that out? <laughs> uh, it's a constant learning process. Yeah. I mean, I start because my early experience was with search engine optimization. That's where I started paying attention to what algorithms do and how they work and everything. Right. Um, but it's it's staying on top of staying on top of the industry, reading all the latest stuff, and and experimenting. So I have you know I've done a podcast. Uh, I had a podcast for the longest time, almost 400 episodes. Uh, did that to figure out how to do it. Right? Yeah. Um, but it's a sandbox that yeah. I get to play in. Yeah. And I have my own websites, and my own blog, and my own newsletter and everything. So having those things that I can experiment in helps me figure out, you know, how the algorithms work. Interesting. So after 400 episodes of a podcast, why did you stop? Well, it wasn't 400 episodes, but oh. it was almost 400. Almost. Uh, sorry, almost. My bad. <laughs> my bad. <laughs> Sounds better than 360. <laughs> Seven. Okay. Uh, yeah. So after three hundred and sixty-seven so, okay. ish. Yeah, ish. Ish. Why did you decide to discontinue doing? Because I because I done everything that I needed to do in terms of learning. Yeah. About how to do a podcast. I mean, I really enjoyed it. What it did, it gave me discipline to make sure that I was, you know, I was staying on top of what was going on in mm -hmm. digital, and then talking about it. So, writing about it is all that stuff kind of makes me more thoughtful about what it is, right? Um, but I stopped doing it because I didn't have enough time to do it and I wanted to write a book, so. That's fair, <laughs> I mean. So I'll use that time to write share a book. in different ways. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we were just on a call the other day and that was one of the things you brought up is have you guys ever thought about a podcast? And so it is something that you think is of value, oh, obviously. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the value, so, Especially, too, in this age where, I know you want to talk about AI later, but yep. as AI has become more prominent, um, I think there's going to be a desire for things that are obviously human. 
Yeah. And podcasts are that. It's an, mm. in, you know, you're eavesdropping on an intimate conversation and you feel like over time, if you listen to that conversation, that podcast over and over again, you get to know the people who are doing the podcast. And so mm. there's, uh, there's that kind of thing that I don't think AI is going to replicate. Okay. All right. We've held off long yeah. enough. Since we're there, <laughs> why don't we go We'll there. let you talk about AI now. So AI, I mean, it's been around for a while, but it really kind of became mainstream just overnight. So explain why, how. Well, so yes, it's been around for a while and I have been, you know, I mean, I have been telling people for years that Google is not a search engine company, it's an AI company. Yeah. Um, so they've been working on it forever too. Um, but the fact that when J Chat GPT came out to public, um, this new version, this different version of AI, generative AI, blows people away. Yeah. I mean, if you use it, it's just it, stunning. It, it creeps me out, actually. I'm not gonna <laughs> lie. I'm yeah. not gonna lie. So um, when that when that product went public, that's that's what blew it up in the mainstream, and all of a sudden everybody's like what is this yeah. <laughs> yeah and now everybody's building it and you're seeing it built into everything and so microsoft is using chat gpt technology to it's just weaving it into everything all of their products into their office suite into their uh back office uh infrastructure into their bing search engine uh mm -hmm. they've released a co-pilot uh, uh app for there's all kinds of different versions of of uh, generative AI, Google is weaving it into the search results into their office suite. Um, there's a chatbot called P Pi AI that is my favorite one because it actually feels like you're talking to a human being. Literally, it's voice activated, so you just hold a conversation with it. You don't type it in. How does it work? I don't understand it. <laughs> I understand what it does, but like, how? Where is the information coming from that it's yeah. gathering? Like, so that's the other thing about Pi is it, it's, so Pi is started by uh, Musta, Musta, Mustafa uh, Suleiman, who used to lead Google's DeepMind uh, AI division, and so he's got deep experience mm -hmm. in that. Um, I don't know specifically how it works necessarily in terms of, uh, but it's got. It's got access to the internet because I can ask him about you know how the Vikings season went and we'll have up to date information. I can. Which is crazy. To um, me. But the generative AI stuff, it takes. How do I? It's kind. Of, it's predictive. It's um, basically it's auto auto suggest on steroids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what it is, it's it's they're taking all the world's text, just in terms of you know ChatGPT kind of generative AI, not imagery. Um, they're taking all the world's publicly available knowledge and applying mathematical formulae to the uh, to the words. And you know, I'm not a mathematician. <laughs> I'm not a data scientist. I don't don't you know, develop AI, but yeah. they that's how they that's how it's able to understand context. So it's semantic relationships between the different words, yeah. and the more f the stronger the relationship is between those words, the more likely a certain outcome will be based on your prompt, and that's how they do it. Where do you think AI is going to be in a year from now? I mean, it, it to me it already does a lot, and so I can't imagine the where future of AI. But where are we going? Yeah, I mean, I don't. Who knows? Yeah. Um, I don't think a year from now I can. It, it, I've never seen a technology be adopted so quickly and um, improve so rapidly. Like I use Midjourney, and I've I've used Midjourney. I don't know, probably half a year or more now. And every ver they come out with a new version frequently, and new each new version gets a, a noticeably better, just much mm -hmm. much better. So the thing about generative imagery is a lot of them are really bad at doing hands. Yeah. It's just like the hands are mangled. They have six fingers instead of five or whatever. Oh, funny. Yeah. <laughs> and so that has become to get better. That's getting better and better. Um, AI imagery, you can go down some really good rabbit holes on the internet of like bad AI generated oh, yeah, yeah. imagery. Yeah. And it it is a fun activity, actually. Uh, <laughs> Don't use this, but. <laughs> I have plenty of those bad examples, too. Yeah, um, But. So where is it going to be from a year now? 
Um, so, I mean, so ChatGPT is working on version five. It's currently version four. Um, Sam Altman says he's leading, leads OpenAI. Uh, says it's going to be doing a lot better than the current version. The current version is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. um, what you're starting to so I, I think what you'll probably see is once Amazon gets its act together, and probably Google will do it before Amazon, just based on what I know right now. My niece is going to kill me for saying this. She works, <laughs> she works in, on, on the uh, A division in, uh -oh. in Amazon. Uh -oh. um, but you know, take that generative AI technology and apply it to your smart speaker, which right now is pretty dumb. Yeah. You know, my, my Alexa will, I ask it for the, the forecast and specific things that it knows about, but things that it doesn't know about, it doesn't, it's, it's useless. Yeah. Um, Siri frequently tells me, I can't do that on iPhone. And yeah. I get really <laughs> mad at her when she can't just do it for me. <laughs> um, Google's smart, smart speaker is a lot smarter because it has the whole, you know, ever since Google has been collecting stuff from the web. So you can ask it much better, it gives you much better answers based on its available resources, which is, you know, all the web. Um, in fact, it also remembers, so, you know, I, my, my Google Home is connected to my Google account, obviously, and I used when I played football, I would ask Google how long it takes to drive to football. And because Google, I've got my Google Maps app, I use it for navigation. Yeah. Um, I go to a field and I go there every week. Google knows that I'm going to play football. Is that how, like, every time I start up my car, it automatically, like, pulls up a map and tells me how far I am from home? Because you have your, your address yeah. built into the, yeah, yeah. 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 So, it, you know, Google knows about me, so it tailors its, its yeah. responses. But take that tech, the generative technology, couple it with the voice, voice activation, yeah. and your speakers, you're going to be able to have a normal conversation normal quote unquote uh, what feels like a normal conversation with your speaker so I see that going the other aspect is multimodal so search now is you know chatbots now are just text based or mm -hmm. the uh, audio activated but they're going to be able to create starting to Bing can create an image for you hmm. um, but video is coming along not mm -hmm. there yet yeah. but video, video will be the next uh, version of uh, of generative and, and AI. Yeah. One That's other place we'll probably be in a year, we'll be reflecting on an important election year. So mm -hmm. while this is not meant to be time stamped or time sensitive, we are talking at the beginning of 2024. And not only does the United States have a pretty pivotal election season, but I know there are other countries in the world who do too. and. So there's already a lot of discussion about that because we know, in at least in the U.S., in the last large election, but we also know in lots of other <laughs> elections, social media and digital have played, and new technology have played a pivotal role in those election seasons and outcomes in both informing and misinforming people. Um, and there have been a lot of changes that have happened. And so as somebody who's been around blogging and talking about e-democracy and um, content for many years and seeing this rise of AI at this important pivotal time, how is AI going to help it? And how, are we, how should we be prepared for it to potentially harm it? I think, well, starting with the worst first, is take what we've learned about social media and extrapolate it a hundredfold. I mean, it's yeah. like, it's, it's, it's a massive danger. It's really a massive danger. Um, I think the thing, you know, the, the, the guard against it is when a known figure is out of character. Mm. So if they're saying something that, that doesn't seem right yeah. based on what I know about them or yeah. Then that's something where you want to pause and mm -hmm. say, is this real or not? But the problem is that question, is this real or not? What is it? Deep fakes? Is that? Yeah. 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 And, but now, I mean, you're talking about 
imagery can be created by AI. Um, so we're n it's not even just a human on Photoshop who's trying to change something to make it look right. nefarious. Now you don't even have to do that. Within yeah. a second, you can sit, you can input the prompts and get that. Video is coming along. You can have videos of people potentially saying something to where we already have a problem of people self-identify if they think something mm -hmm. is real or not or what how they want to think about it and now add on top of that that there may be all this content that how would one ever know yeah, yeah. and i mean we haven't talked about audio audio is pretty uh, generative ai audio is is already there i mean it's already capable of yeah i can record what five seconds of my own voice. There's cause there's a lot more than five seconds of my own voice out there on the internet, but so I can take that and it can replicate me, yeah. my mm -hmm. voice. So everybody, you know, all fam friends and family, you all need to have a safe word. Yeah. Because you'll get a call from somebody who you think is somebody you know, and they'll be asking for some personal oh, information. Wow. Yeah. And if, if that sounds dodgy, like, what's the safe word? Yeah, oh, gosh, that's so fascinating because that's already happening. Yeah. I mean, don't oh, we yeah. all have a story in our family of, like, grandma got a call from a fake person saying that they're in jail, tries to go to the bank, and the bank stops a transaction or whatever. Um, or maybe it's a king from Africa who's asked you for money or whatever that thing <laughs> is. Yeah. We've all... And, Nigerian um, prince. Yes, yeah. Nigerian prince. There's been a lot of those Thank for you years. for that. Yes, but now... Okay, so restate what you're saying, because I think that that's really important. So, if yeah, you, the, 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 anybody can scam anybody by replicating a known person's voice. Yeah. And, uh, and so, think, put it in a political context, you're going to get robocalls from AI, who is from, you know, your candidate. And it's not going to be, you know, it, it's probably going to be opposition. Right. It might be the actual campaign, like, because... That's how more do you efficient. Know? How can you tell the difference, though? I mean, if they are delivering a message that's somewhat along the lines of what you'd expect, yeah. like you, yeah, there's it's hard to tell. Yeah, yeah, and it's scary. I've, yeah, I've seen some. There's some AI technology that will do robocalling. Yeah. What are we doing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, where is this world going, Liz? Yeah. Um, <laughs> on the, the other good hand, sides, yes. <laughs> the yes, good side, yes. The good side of it. Um, I think we're going to see. So I, I've been saying I think we're going to see some absolutely stunning stunning advances out of AI, like in terms of su curing diseases. Well, like- Oh, interesting. Cancer may be cured because we don't have the ability as human beings to sift through all the variables of data that might allow us to identify the cause of a disease or huh. identify drugs that will cure it. Because right. AI can piece together everything that's so much there on the gonna, internet. It's going to see yeah. things that, that, that humans just are not capable of, of seeing because I've there's too much data. That. Yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah. Huh. Um, I, think you'll see a blo I think you'll see some kid in his basement, the, the proverbial kid in his basement, <laughs> um, create a blockbuster film all on his own mm -hmm. using AI. Wow. Because the, t the technology is going to be there. And... Uh, but yeah, um, the real the real conversation in AI now is about uh, what is it? General AI. Can't remember what the phrase is exactly, but it's it's basically when AI becomes more capable of doing things than humans, and uh, that's probably going to happen. So, what does that mean for? Will Who AI knows? be able to create that blockbuster all on its own, or it still requires a human with some idea driving it? Well, How the, does that work? The, the worry among the people who worry about this is that is sentience. Yeah. It's the HAL, HAL computer from 2001. I wouldn't do that, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's, that's the worry because, you know, they could very legitimately con uh, conclude that we're in the way. Yeah. Um, so that's 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 the fear, and you know, until until generative AI came around, I started really diving into it. Um, it was always a science fiction. I mean, the science fiction is written about all the outcomes already. We already know how this ends, basically, <laughs> based on science fiction. But I hadn't thought about it or worried about it. I yeah. don't know that I worry about it as much as some of the people who worry about it, but it's not beyond the realm of possibility. 
Well, I'm grateful that people do worry about it. Um, just in the same way that we all lived through the experience of 1999, the worry that all of a sudden Y2K world was going to end because computers and clocks didn't know what to do <laughs> in this new millennium. And um, I've been watching the 1990s show that is on Disney Plus. Very good, by the way. Oh. Um, and there's a whole episode about it, but a lot of the people um, quoted in it talk about the fact that um, people worried about it and planned for it, and that's why it wasn't catastrophic, as opposed to, see, it wasn't catastrophic, and yeah. we all move forward. And so I think the fact that there are people who do worry about this and are um, engaged in trying to mitigate catastrophic right. endings um, is good because I'm not capable of doing yeah. that piece, but I do want to know that there are people who can. Yeah. That might have been the last time we came together as a nation and did did one whole thing to address a, address a major issue, because you're right. It's like People were worrying about it. They started planning for it. There was a presidential commission and I had a Y2K czar to lead it and, and corporations like Okay, we need to do this. Yeah, it was scary though. Nobody yeah. knew what was going to yeah. happen, yeah. And, and guess what happened? Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. So, David, I know let's you work hope a that's, lot. Let's hope that's the outcome of that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Anyway. <laughs> so you work a lot, but I know you don't work all the time. So what do you like to do when you're not working, and not researching anything digital or anything AI? Oh. What, what? Or writing tell, a book? Tell us, yep. Yes. Yes. What, I like to else? build. I like to build custom GPTs. <laughs> Sorry, I that's had, digital. We that's haven't digital. talked about that. That's <laughs> yeah. that's the other aspect of AI we oh. haven't talked about. But anyway, uh, what? Well, I I like music, so I play guitar. I have a couple of guitars that I play. So I think every time I get on a client call and it's the first time they've met you, <laughs> that's always the first thing they ask about are your guitars that you have in in your office. Yeah. So I have. I have three slots that of guitars that hang on the back wall of my office, which is turns out to be a fantastic Zoom uh, background. Um, but yeah, so I, I play guitar, I read, I hang out with uh, with my uh, significant other. <laughs> <laughs> play and football. Your cats. And I have cats. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. And don't forget football. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, I don't Not play anymore, football but anymore, but sadly. Yes. But you used to. I used to. I have. I think I count. Uh, last count was I think I've got. I don't know. I've got more than ten, more than ten broken bones <laughs> playing Gosh. football. In fact, when I first came to Tunheim, I had a broken finger, and it was on my right hand. And I was shaking hands with my new colleagues, and everybody's like, "Oh, oh, oh okay." No. <laughs> yeah, don't worry about really, it. it's fine. No. It's fine. Um, yeah. So uh, I need to, I need a new sport. Oh. Well, you can golf. No, that's not a sport. That's a social occasion. It's <laughs> a leisure, leisure occasion. We're going to set that aside for the golfers. Don't be offended. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> David is opinion. No, I, I will say uh, I did golf once, and um, it was a family thing. My brother told me, you should probably go out before we start and take a couple of swings and practice. I'm like, how hard can it be? I'm pretty athletic. I mean, it's yeah. just hitting the ball. Yeah. And uh, quickly learned that, yeah, I yeah. probably should have practiced a little. And you never, never did it easiest. again? I, I have golfed once, but I actually did manage to get a good a good swing in eventually. So Proud of you. I think if I if I went back to it, I might be able to pick it up. But yeah. I want something more vigorous. Than, but it has to be a game. So I've been trying to get Pam to play tennis with me, but she doesn't oh, want to play tennis with me. because ball? That's not the same. That's, oh, that's easier. Great. Don't say that to Pat. Love pickleball. I mean, it's fun. I, I'd play it again, but I'd rather play tennis. But Pam doesn't want to be chasing balls around. I that makes I'm sense. Not that good. That makes right? sense. If I'm I mean. just beginning, yeah. <laughs> that's totally fair. Okay, one more question for you before we go. So, what is the one thing you cannot leave home without? And you can't say your keys. You can't say your phone, and you can't say your car. My pants. <laughs> How <laughs> practical. <laughs> uh, that's tough. I mean, I don't know. I mean, if I get if I get the meta um, 
glasses, the Ray Bans. Yeah. That's probably it, at least for a while until I until I see everything it can do and then lose interest. Um, internet. It's on your phone now. Thankfully, it wasn't. Me. <laughs> <laughs> now we can just carry it. With I don't us. know. I mean, I don't really have anything else I need. You don't leave home with a diet coke My every time, license. like I do. Drive it. Well, that. Okay, I'm He's got practical a list of all answers. The you can't say. No, <laughs> just kidding. Well, it's a smile. Oh, that was good. There we go. That's lovely. <laughs> it's kind of like one of our former colleagues that David also worked with, um, Darren, likes to ask if you could be anything in the refrigerator, what would you be? And I always <laughs> love when he'd pull that one out because it always brought interesting answers. So how about the refrigerator? If you could be anything in the refrigerator, what would you be? I mean, if I had lobster in my refrigerator all the time. <laughs> oh, that would be nice. I'd do that. Yeah. yeah. Good yeah. answer. Yeah. Uh, here's a question. The questions you always want to ask but don't ask. Mm -hmm. So for interviews, I always want to ask this, but I never do because it's too, too mean. Um, <laughs> oh, boy. But it's, it's, there's a reason behind it. So if you had nine lives yeah. as a cat, how would you spend each of them? Ooh. That takes some thought and time. Right. Yeah. Which is why it's going to mean to ask him. Yeah. Yeah. That's like a podcast but it gets on out, its own. But it gets at a lot of um, deep thinking. So the point, the point that the reason why I want to ask it is because it kind of reveals whether somebody has a lot of interests or not a lot of interests. Oh, if you can spend a whole lifetime doing something, yeah. if you're really passionate about a lot of things, that's the kind of person I want to work with. Huh. That's good to know. I like that question. That is, that is good. That, one's, that one you need to prep in advance for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You need a list, a nine point list. Here are each of my lives. Uh, but I'll be thinking about that later. So like we, we might have a follow like up a, on that. An all staff meeting or something. It's a good happy you know? hour one too. Happy hour. There you, there, there you go. Get deep. Okay. So we talked about the past. We've talked a little bit about the future, but um, you're doing this still in 10 years. Now, I know there's a futurist in you. So how would you, what do you think digital will continue to be like if you had to say in 2030s, what are we talking about? I would say, I mean, in 10 years, we're probably going to have video game technology that is, that is, I mean, okay, take AI and apply it to video technology, right? The generative mm -hmm. stuff where a, it's an AI bot that I can actually have a conversation with. In video games, you have uh, the main character. You can play against other pe people, but most of the population of the video game is non-player characters. They're programmed to have a role to make it feel like a, a realistic environment and they just have limited things that they can do. But if yeah. you can put generative AI into each of those non-player characters, then they actually become lifelike. And you can like, if I'm walking down the street and I bump into a non-player character now, the character's programmed to say, excuse me, or what the hell, dude, <laughs> you know? It's, it's programmed to re react in just a couple of different ways, and that's mm -hmm. its only role. But if it's got generative AI, it probably has a backstory already, yeah. and if it's, interacting with other characters it's taking that information adding it to its experience mm -hmm. so then now i can have a conversation with that non-player character and it can become part of my story mm -hmm. and so video game technology becomes just this weird wild open world thing where anything can happen so we're talking about the metaverse really yeah, yeah. Uh, read read snow snow crash by neil stevenson that's kind of the origin of that idea the technology, if we you know, put AI into that, then that concept probably takes hold. And so what does our work look like within the metaverse? Yeah. That's kind of the 10-year uh, the vision that that's my best shot at where that's going. I don't even know what to do with that, to tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> well, it will be fascinating ride, and it's fun to do it together so we thank you for coming on and chatting with us about what it means to be understood and how you have gotten to where you are and what you bring to what we do my pleasure this has been a blast i hope you'll have me back <laughs> please <laughs> we'll see we'll see depends on how much you pay us <laughs> thanks david thanks, thanks david <laughs>